friends, it's my great delight to welcome you to the 2011 Skoll World Forum. Whether it's climate change, education, or human rights, the only way we're going to survive as a species is to pull together in our collective self-interest. We've just had a networking session. I've met two people who I think really could be potential partners, so I'm happy already. Stop forcing on people what you think you can deliver best and start asking what they really want and delivering it. If we are not sustainable and we are telling our client to be sustainable, we are actually being dishonest. I strongly believe the importance of convening social innovators. You know, it's, it's really like a jolt, a boost of adrenaline rush for a week. I will never give up. I will continue to do it. And, and how can I give up? We do what we do because we love it. Challenge education. Challenge the system. You get chills and you just know that you are part of something bigger. I think it set a new standard for awards like this. As someone joked from the stage that these are like the Oscars of the social enterprise movement. And I think that is absolutely right. Rebecca Oni, Health Leads. <laughs> Ellen Moyer, New Teachers Center. Mata Chavan, Pratham. Ned Breslin, Water for People. I never knew what a social entrepreneur was, you know, 10 years ago, or so, and now, now I do. And, uh, and I see how powerful these people are being in the world and, and in terms of transforming them. Ladies and gentlemen, the Skoll Foundation is truly honored to award the first ever Skoll Global Treasure Award to Archbishop Desmond Tutu. <laughs>
So here's a little bit about the uh, agenda. It's just uh, two and a half days, but it feels like a week. Um, so they take you uh, starting on a Wednesday. They have these wonderful walking tours of Oxford. You do a, a networking activity because there's about 800 people there and it's really critical that you get to connect with folks. So they do a networking activity. There's a wonderful welcome reception and opening plenary and delicate dinners in those amazing Oxford dining halls where you feel like you're at a scene from Harry Potter. Um, and then last year, folks who went to school, or maybe some of you remember, there was a little volcano action happening in Iceland. And so they had a volcano reunion party this year, uh, which was a lot of fun and gave people an excuse to drink like they needed it. Um, and because of Jeff Skoll's uh, work, there was a screening, uh, Sundance screening of the team. Uh, Thursday, you go right into sessions and end with a, a, an award ceremony. And then uh, there's the final sessions on uh, Friday and a closing plenary. Thank you. So let's, uh, let's look just for a second at the uh, walking tour of Oxford. And if you look at this slide um, on the bottom, la bottom left, you'll see about, uh, I don't know, six Canadians in that group. So the Canadians all took advantage uh, of the walking tour. And I just think that Oxford is part of the reason why the Skoll World Forum is a success. I don't think it would work the same way if it was held somewhere else. It's such an amazing place with an amazing history, and it is a critical stakeholder in the whole Skoll experience. The first connections is a bit of a speed dating uh, that we've heard about. You sort of sit um, in a row of tables, a row of chairs facing each other, and you have like a minute and a half to say what your social innovation is, exchange your business card, and move on to the next person. And these are critical connections because you need to be able to connect with folks through this really frenetic pace that is this Gold World Forum. They do a great job of giving you places to connect. And if you look at... Um, this one right up here. This is uh, Jim Fruchterman. Uh, Jim runs an organization called Benetech, which helped uh, develop reading devices for the blind. And I have a client here at Mars called eSight that has been trying to get in touch with Jim and didn't have any luck. So I basically was able to not grab, but maybe just discuss with him, take advantage of the opportunity of being at school to tell him about our client, and now they are in contact with each other. The other thing about Jim is he wrote a really great article for the Stanford Social Innovation Review on choosing your legal structure. And we have a lot of social entrepreneurs here at Mars who say, here's my idea, what's the right legal structure that I need to put in place to have impact? And this was a great article. It just isn't Canadian. It's very American. So I had asked uh, Stanford for permission to Canadianize it, never heard back. But I was able to talk to Jim at school and get permission to get that done. So we're looking forward to releasing that article. So Jeff's school sets the tone. It's the eighth anniversary of the school World Forum. As I mentioned, 800 delegates from 126 countries. Uh, this year, and Skoll is really good at doing celebrations, this year was a celebration of Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who they called a hero of humanity, and Bill Drayton. This was the 30th anniversary of Ashoka. Ashoka is also a global movement uh, recognizing the role of social entrepreneurs. They talked about, and this was interesting for them, because a lot of it does focus on hero worship, but this time they stopped and they talked about the ecosystem of support around social entrepreneurs that is necessary to support them, all the enablers, government, policymakers, impact investors that are a critical part of this new and emerging ecosystem to support social entrepreneurs. But I think what Jeff did really well was he was hopeful. He said that we can affect large scale systems change as we've done it before with the Marshall Plan, the eradication of smallpox, and many other situations. This is an uh, Oxfordian, I think that's the right term, uh, a philosopher who Jeff uh, called a social entrepreneur. And it's not language that I would normally attribute to this guy, but Jeff says he made his own rules. Does anybody know who that is? Pardon? It's Dr. Seuss. It's Dr. Seuss who, uh, who went to school and uh, was an interesting kind of philosopher in his own right. Uh, but when you think about it, he absolutely did rewrite the rules of children's literature. And uh, I've got hundreds of those books in my house, as I'm sure you do as well if you've had children. 
So, large-scale uh, systems change. This is uh, Stefan Chambers, who's the director at the SAGE uh, Business School at Oxford, which is where uh, the school uh, World Forum is um, sponsored out of. So, large systems change should be, and we heard some of these words today, intentional, positive, important, clear on the need we are solving, and measurable. So they talked a lot about, and I know in this movement we also talk a lot about design, design systems thinking. What does that mean? And for us here at Mars, a lot of that means how do you actually frame the problem properly before you go about trying to solve it? And although we know that the world is connected and business as usual is not good enough and single agency solutions are inadequate, Success and failures are both important. Although we know all that, we're not having the global discussion that we need to actually affect these large systems change. And in typical Oxfordian style, Stefan said, we can't understand the not yet unimagined. By an ecosystems approach, they think way bigger than public-private partnerships. It's the major change wherein the issue is at the center of what we want. So the issue, it's issue focused. And then they talked about Pierre Teilhard de Chardin's The Phenomenon of Man, who says, to be itself, humanity must advance in the direction of convergence. And I hope that when you came into Mars today, you noticed the convergence innovation flags flying in the atrium. I think we listen, and I think we are onto something here but we know that this is not simple, that what we do is compartmentalize our lives, that's how we cope with ambiguity, but our goal should be to see ourselves as whole system people, whole systems thinkers, and that's how we're gonna get to real big change. Now the other thing about school is the celebrity factor. Uh, Peter Gabriel uh, sang a tribute to Desmond Tutu. Uh, Baba Mal, who is a Senegal musician, very famous. Her Majesty Queen Noor of Jordan. And in the bottom left you see Annie Lennox. She wasn't there uh, this year, she was there last year, but I wanted to tell you a quick story. It was She was sitting beside me and uh, I was watching the people up on the stage very intently and when they when you have a question, they hand you the microphone. And so this woman beside me took the microphone and you're asked to introduce yourself. And she says, hello, I'm Annie Lennox, I'm a singer. And I went, oh my God, I'm sitting next to Annie Lennox and I never noticed it. And, and I had told this woman from Australia that I met last year about this story. And she said to me when I saw her this year, I tell everyone that story, except I say it was me sitting next to Annie Lennox. Um, the one uh, on the top uh, left is uh, Ju uh, Jude Law. And everybody at school is very cool. They just let everybody do their own thing. But I snapped that picture of him on the Blackberry, which is why it's a little bit cheesy. And Goldie Hawn was there, and I didn't have enough nerve to snap her picture. But those are the kind of folks that hang out. This is the celebrity factor at school. But there is no celebrity like Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And hopefully you heard the beginning of the video. It's his laugh. It's his laugh that is absolutely amazing. And they described him as um, I can't either, bending the arc of humanity, uh, the moral conscience of a nation. But he humbly begins his presentation by saying, I stand out in the crowd only because they are carrying me on their shoulders. We are made for goodness, caring, sharing, and transcendence. And he ends his presentation by encouraging us not only to save, but to savor the world. It was a really magical moment to be in the room with him. But one high profile celebrity was missing, Mohammed Yunus, and for folks who have been following the news, um, Mohammed Yunus is under attack in Bangladesh, um, but there was a presentation by the Friends of Grameen, uh, led by Mary Robinson, the former president of Ireland. And really what they're saying is that the government is uh, trying to take over Grameen and they're asking that he retire because he's passed the mandatory retirement age of 65. But what he says is that Grameen is not owned by government, it is owned by the women who take out loans and 96.5% of the women who, um, no, sorry, 96.5% of the loans are by women. 
Um, and so the, the value there is what often happens is when men get loans and make money, they tend to leave the village. The women tend to stay in the village and support their families. And so it's quite a nasty fight. Um, but uh, he has some pretty high profile friends and uh, we're hoping that this will all uh, be worked out. I heard about this at a, a place called Oxford Jam, which is right across the street from Oxford. And this is a, a typical British kind of tradition. So Oxford is uh, the, uh, the whole school world forum. It's, it's limited in terms of the number of people that can get in. But Oxford Jam is just held in the Jam Factory, which is a restaurant across the street. It's completely open. And you can come in and do whatever session you want. So it's organized by a guy called Ben Metz and people like um, Liam Black, uh, come and organize cabarets and other kinds of events there. And it is an opportunity to discuss some pretty challenging issues that can't necessarily get on the agenda at school. So let's go back to microfinance for a session. Because it's so topical, there was a lot of discussion. So the noise around microfinance uh, comes from the fact that there have been a couple of profitable IPOs. There's charges of usury rates of interest, inconclusive research findings on the impact, political witch hunts such as that which is happening in Bangladesh. And there's news stories, like there's been 65 suicides in injury attributed to over indebtedness. They just don't mention that four of those were only related to microfinance institutions. But here's some interesting facts. Since 2009, there have been 3,500 new microfinance institutions in 115 countries with 190 million users who previously didn't have access to capital. There's about 65 billion in debt or equity outstanding, and the majority, the vast, vast majority of MFIs are nonprofits. We had to some really great opportunities for discussion. So is a for-profit model needed to achieve scale? Can you maximize profits and help the poor? Should MFIs themselves be self-sustaining or should they be eligible to get government and philanthropic support the way we get support for education or healthcare? How do we build out the MFI ecosystem? Do we need to support financial literacy or do we just give out the loans? And how do we balance the focus on access, which is how do we make sure that more and more people get access to money and empowerment to make sure it just doesn't drive people into debt? Well, the MasterCard Foundation believes this is the way to go. And at school, they announced a $45 million partnership to uh, scale innovative uh, microfinance in Uganda in a partnership with BRAC. Who knows where the MasterCard Foundation is located? Where? It's in Toronto. It's in Toronto. So I think we should be having some really great discussions with the MasterCard Foundation if they're able to go to Oxford and announce a $45 million donation to BRAC. And Rita Roy, who has been a great supporter of the social finance movement here in Toronto, in fact, she was a member of the Social Finance Task Force, is really interested to be engaged in this work. Systems innovation, barriers to large scale change. So we talk a lot about open source, but as is often the case in innovation, it just takes someone to reframe it a little bit. So someone says, open source is not new. In 1596, maps moved from private to public good. We've had over 4,000 years of agricultural development that's been open sourced. And IDEO launched their nonprofit, IDEO.org, IDEO, IDEO where they said that you need to start leveraging existing human behavior to break barriers, scale by going to where people congregate, and prototype early. And again, as we've had discussions here today, they spend a lot of time saying that failing may not be good, but intelligent learning is and really recognizing that what motivates all of us is the opportunity to be creative. I want to give you a little case example of a group called Signal Point Partners. They're working in mobile tech for social change, wherein 6.5 billion, this is US, is transacted in 10 to $15 increments through 23,000 on the ground agents. It can also be linked to solar panels and a rent-to-own plan. So you have your phone and you control when your solar panels go on and off and that's how you pay for it. It's $100 to install it. People can't afford that, but they can't afford these incremental payments through their cell phone. Really incredible stuff. Why does it work? They don't trust the banks. 
And we talk about B2B or B2C or C2C, they talk about P2P, people to people. And the key, the key is in the distribution channel. And someone reminded us that in fact, we all work for Google. And this is a Google symbol promoting uh, Canada's election, which I hadn't seen, but which I thought was very cool. There's a lot of great stuff on the Skoll website, and I encourage you to check it out. But one thing there's not is uh, this session on the world in 25 years, mega trends, and a context for large scale change. Because this guy who I've highlighted, Richard Seymour, who runs an organization called The Future of the Future, had us thinking a little differently and didn't want to share his presentations. So one of the things he said, and why I want to focus on his work, he said the greatest barrier to change is the desk. We see things not as they are, but as we are. And that the QWERTY keyboard that we all use was meant to slow us down because technology could not keep up. I also learned that Apple now has a ringtone, the mosquito, that kids can hear and teachers can't. So I said to my 13 year old, look at this. He goes, yeah, mom, we all use it. So I did not know that. I had to go to Oxford to find out what my 13 year old could tell me, but actually he played it and I can't hear it. He's like, you can't hear this? How can you not hear this? So uh, this is some interesting uh, developments in technology. Um, he, he started off, Richard Seymour started off by holding up a slide and he said, you know, who knows what this is? And we're like, it's a slide, I don't know. And he said it costs $250 million or some astronomical figure. And basically it was the mapping of the human genome. And he says this person, uh, which is a complete person, uh, could live to be a thousand years old. I mean, we talk about the sort of aging tsunami or demographic challenges. We haven't seen anything yet. So what does he say? He says you have to plan for discontinuity, I can't say this word, discontinuity. There we go, plan for discontinuity. Um, sustainability is the deck, get out more, stop asking, start watching. There's a lot of anthropologists and ethnographers in this space now. Um, talk to someone who works there, wherever the there is. Optimism, truth, honor, and understand the very young. So he showed us a picture of a typewriter. He said, what is this? Of course, after the slide, we were all distrustful of our own opinions, but it, it's a, we said, ah, oh, it's a typewriter. He goes, yeah, it's a typewriter. Of course it's a typewriter. He was quite a character. But he says he hangs out with seven-year-olds, and so he did a focus group with a bunch of seven-year-olds once, and he said, what is this? And they said, cool, it's a computer that types as you uh, print, like as it prints as you type, and you don't have to plug it in, right? And I thought, wow, that is so cool. Um, and so what he said is in working with kids, that kids of the future will ask, what change are you making, not how much money are you making? And when we see sort of 20-somethings coming in and asking, what's our double or triple bottom line, that that's how they want to live their lives, it's not unreasonable to think the next generation will focus more on impact than they will on money. And I wanted to uh, tell you just this quick story about uh, a Singapore program uh, that lets you book your doctor's appointment online. Now, when's the last time you booked your doctor's appointment? You had to call up, they're way, especially if it's just a physical, it's way out. How simple should this be? Why can't I just do this online? This is the relentless incrementalism we were talking about earlier. Some of this stuff is revolutionary. Some of it is just making our life a little bit easier. All of it is good. The other thing about school is you get to meet the leaders, you get to meet the thought leaders, and we're doing a lot of work, as you all know, if you hang out at Mars at all, in the areas of social finance and social impact bonds. Arthur Wood was there from Total Impact Investors. He used to run the social finance program for Ashoka. Uh, Stephen Lloyd, who developed the community interest company, and he talked about the next wave of CIC and the kind of changes, what they've learned and the kind of changes they're making to legislation. Um, Andrew Kasoy from B Lab, and again, we're working to bring the B Corporation model here to Ontario. Able to go and find out the latest on what's going on with them. And Mark Owens, who developed the L3C, or the Low Profit Limited Liability Corporation legislation in the US. These are pioneering corporate and legal structures where you get first-hand access to the pioneers themselves.
Toby Eccles is with Social Finance UK, the leader in the whole area of social impact bonds. And he was able to update us on the latest thinking that he's doing as well. And there's some really interesting developments, not only from the UK, but there were folks there from Australia and the different tack that they're taking. Other countries are very interested in this, and Canada just needs to be there thinking about what our unique Canadian spin is on this issue. If you want to find out more about social impact bonds, I'm happy to chat with you after the presentation. Then there was a great discussion on the dimensions of leadership. What does it actually mean to be a leader in this space? Well, these are some of the questions they threw out. How do you stay motivated? What do you do to stay sane? Who supports you? And what do you say to your kids when you're helping others? So you heard uh, Celia speak in the film. She, she says, I cannot give up. I must help victims of human trafficking. And she gave a really, um, what I thought was horrific example of what's happening in the Philippines where they're selling girls as young as 14 into human trafficking and uh, prostitution. And so she gave an example of a young girl who was forced to drip the equivalent of a cotton ball in pigeon's blood and insert it in herself so that she could be sold as a virgin to every person who wanted to use her. She herself was jailed for a very long period of time, did not, gave birth to two kids in jail and didn't, when her son was taken from her, she didn't see him for 12 years. And yet she is driven, driven to go on to help others. Paul Farmer, uh, an amazing social entrepreneur, Partners for Health, tells when he was in medical school and he lost three friends who were in, uh, working in India to poor medical, medical conditions that were easily preventable. They talked about trying to give yourself balance as a gift. There was a guy called Joe. Joe is from India, God's gift, he said, uh, to the untouchables. He was gonna change the world. As long as there were people living with inadequate conditions, the work must continue. He tells the story of missing the birth of all of his children because of his work. He often blames his wife who said that she miscalculated, but aside from that, uh, he tells a wonderful story. Um, the Arch, as they call Archbishop Desmond Tutu, uh, talks about us making him proud to be human. But then he goes into a range of stories about being humiliated when his father was called a boy by shopkeepers. And what he said is, you know, nature does not allow for a vacuum. When he became a leader, everyone else was in jail. And so he had to step up to the plate. And then there were some amazing questions from the audience because the thing about school is although there's phenomenal people on stage, there's even better people all around you. So people said, how can I be here? I do my work, this is more time away from my family, how can I be here? And then this one young man stood up and said, my mom was a social entrepreneur. She gave me the courage to live my dreams. And then there were tears, but they weren't only my tears, but there were tears because it was a really moving moment. It was really clear to me that these people have no choice to do what they do. Quick little example of a social innovation in action, riders in health, a uh, husband and wife that were in uh, Haiti, traveling around and saw piles and piles of cars that were in not very good repair. They asked why, and it occurred to them that development agencies buy these vehicles but can't keep them up. So they went into the country, they purchased these vehicles, and they leased them to the, lady, to the aid agencies. But what they also did is would train people on the ground as mechanics. And so now, with these motorcycles and other kinds of devices, people are able to get into communities they were never able to get into before. There's job creation through the mechanics on the ground, and these vehicles are kept in much better repair, which means they're out of the equivalent of the landfill, and these aid agencies are able to afford them. It's a win, 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 win situation. As I mentioned, school talks a lot about awards, and there were four school award winners this year. Uh, Ned Breslin, Water for People, who was able to use things like Google Earth to track where there's problems in the water system. Amazing use of technology. Health leads, Rebecca One. Rebecca was an MSW student who went to work at Boston Medical Center, where there is one social worker for 24,000 patients. 
She saw that it was really terrific that the doctors were able to give out prescriptions, but the problem was oftentimes the patients couldn't read the prescriptions or they would give them a prescription for asthma medicine, but the fact is the house was freezing. The family couldn't afford heat. So she talked the doctors and the administration into writing a prescription that would be given to social workers that she could then take to the um, civil service and they've had incredible success in doing this. So a prescription to have your heat turned on. And there are um, MSW students who are still in schools who are engaged in this program. Uh, Madhav uh, Chafan from Pratham tells a great story about a father lying in a hammock. And there's a great uh, enrollment in India. Kids go to school. The fact is they're just not necessarily learning. So this father's lying in a hammock. He comes along and says, um, I'm here to help your kids read. And he says, my kids don't need help reading. All four of them go to school. He gives a piece of paper to the first one, the eldest one, he can't read it. The next eldest one, he can't read it. The next youngest one, he can't read it, and the youngest one. And at every stage of this conversation, the father moves up and up and up in his hammock until it's really clear that he is um, sending his kids to school and they're not learning. So this is what um, the program Pratham, this is what Pratham does. It actually makes the education system more effective. And finally, Ellen Moore from New Teacher Center in the US. 50% of all new teachers drop out within the first three years, 50%. So there's that investment in their education. And so she set up a, a mentoring system and a whole level of support, a different uh, forms of education that keep them engaged. Um, but I wanted to share with you my favorite from last year, which is a popo, which is these hero rats. And what they do is two really wonderful things. They're able to detect landmines, and because they're so light, they can go on them without setting them off. And now they've trained these rats to sniff out tuberculosis, because apparently there's an odor that comes from your lungs in early stage. And they're able to go into the field and diagnose tuberculosis at a very early stage. These are the kind of people that are at school. Because of the timeliness, the Middle East and Northern Africa region was very much on display. Uh, Queen Noor of Jordan gave a very impassioned presentation talking about, and again, we talked about this a little bit today, reflecting on the changes in the region and noting that a change of leaders is not enough. We need real transformative change that understands power differently. As revolution gives way to politique, there is a fear that women's rights will be sacrificed, and certainly we've seen evidence of that. The warning that she offers is that we can't change one extreme for the other. And a lot of stories about youth, uh, youth affecting real change, and look at this language, armed only with a computer and cell phones and protected only by social networks. What do they need? Good governance that expresses the will of the majority while protecting the minorities, an impartial justice system, educational reform, including education on what it means to be a citizen, access to the necessities of life. What does she want us to do? Don't impose, but don't stand back. Respect the organic development. Engage in development about sustainable and gradual reform. Support humanitarian aid versus military support, much better investment. And to promote tolerance, equity, and democracy across and within borders. Her final call to us all, as justice prevails, so will peace. So what are my reflections? Large scale change is possible. Networking means although the people on the stage have lots to offer, so does the person next to you. That is particularly true in this room. Collaboration is hard, but it is easier when the issue is at the center. We need to find a way to fail and learn and fix that we all need community. And with our best intentions, even our best actions, such as those of Muhammad Yunus land us in trouble, that technology can be transformative or part of my favorite phrase, relentless incrementalism. Hang out with kids more. They give us joy and insight. Being a mom and a social entrepreneur is actually okay. That youth continue to make me hopeful, be it in MENA or in my own office. 
and that it was an honor to go to school, but an even better one to share it with you. Thank you very much.